Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing His Mission. Hmm, that's an interesting subject. This is lesson number seven in that series entitled Sharing the Word. It's the lesson for August 15 of 2020. Um, we're going to do something a little different today, as you'll see, but we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for your guidance and your care and your protection each day. We thank you for this opportunity to talk about your word. May we gather something from this lesson that will inspire us to walk closer with you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Jim, I'm going to ask you to start us off here. When we witness, we speak of Jesus. But what would we know about Jesus without the Bible? In fact, how much would we know about the great controversy, the love of God, the birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and return of our Lord if we did not have the scriptures? From the, this is from the Bible study, Bible guide. study guide. We speak of two great books which teach us about God. One, the book of nature, and two, the Holy Bible. But it is clear that without the Bible, we would know almost nothing about the plan of salvation, the great converse, the apostles, the patriarchs, the story of Jesus, even creation and the flood, as, as you know. So what are we trying to accomplish when we share God's word with a friend? We are not trying to win an argument with them. We are not trying to force them to believe what we believe. We are trying to share Jesus. By sharing the loveliness of Jesus, they, must be they may be attracted, and the Holy Spirit will work on their hearts. The Bible speaks of a number of different symbols of God's Word. Carrie? Starting with Psalm 119, verse 105, Your Word is a lamp to guide me, and a light for my path. That's from American Bible Society, the Holy Bible, 1992. Jeremiah 23, 29, my message is like a fire and like a hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. That's from the Good News Bible. Luke 8, 11, this is what the parable means. The seed is the word of God. It's a Good News Bible again. Matthew 4, 4, but Jesus answered, the scripture says human beings cannot live on bread alone, but need every word that God speaks. Again, from the Good News Bible. Very good. So think of the implications of saying that the word of God is a lamp or a light. And what do we mean when you say the word is like a fire or even a hammer? That seems a little strange to us. And what sense is the word like a seed or even bread? So few people in our world to have any idea of the real teachings of the Bible. I, that's obvious when you hear people start asking quiz questions on TV and everybody stands there like a bump on a log. <laughs> Opening to them the Word of God is like turning on the light. There are many ways in which God's Word is like a fire. It may consume the sin from one's life, but it also burns like a fire in the hearts of those who have accepted the truth, but it, uh, and they cannot keep quiet about it. That's what Paul said, and I agree with him. Seeds hold within themselves the very essence of life. Given the right conditions in the soil, they spring to life and produce plants, food, and many things that we as humans need. Thus, seeds are life-giving. Bread is the very essence of life. A person could survive for a long time on only bread and water. A good loaf of bread meets so many needs. Think of the ways in which bread meets our physical needs and compares with God's Word as it meets our spiritual needs. So look at a couple of passages. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3 here. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. He is the one through whom God created the universe, the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for human sins, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. 
So what's Paul trying to say to us there? Saying Jesus is both human and divine, right? One famous verse that you might have memorized when, back, when you were back in school is found back in Psalm 33, 6 and 9. The Lord created the heavens by his command, the sun, moon, and stars by his spoken word. And then dropping down to verse 9. When he spoke, the world was created. At his command, everything appeared. Um, can you imagine knowing somebody, being a friend of somebody who can just speak and bam, something happens? Hmm. There's no question about the fact that God has creative power. He can speak and hang a world in space. And look at all the worlds he's, he's hung in space already. We cannot even imagine that kind of power. But that power also can reach into the human hearts and transform us into children of God. As human beings, we can speak about what exists, but God can speak into existence that which did not exist. And as you know, the main story about creation is found in Genesis 1 and 2. There are key passages for dealing with that story. In those passages, especially in Genesis 1, it talks about God's creative power. And the Hebrew word is bara, and that's the word which translated create. And this word is used only to describe God's creative power, not used for anything about humans anywhere else. God's power is essential in sustaining life every minute and every second. Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God, Ellen White wrote, Review and Herald, December 2, 1890. So what does that mean? Is God sitting there going boom, 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 boom? What do we mean when we say every, t every pulse beat is, is a rebound, pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God? I think it's kind of a maybe a somewhat poetic uh, way of describing that God sustains things. There's nothing going on with that God isn't the source of it. Exactly. God, all power is is, is that, the source of all energy. Yeah, that marvelous mech thing that the beats that keeps us alive. God put it together. He designed it. He he made it so it works, and so it keeps going based on his power, the power that he gave to it when he created it. And as creatures, no creature is self-existent. Yep. Well, that same power was used to create our world and everyone living here, and everyone living here sustains us on a day-by-day -day basis. Diana? The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power, it begets gets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. Ellen G. White, Book of Education, page 126. Wow. So, why is this incredible power at God's command important to you as an individual? Well, we've already talked about you wouldn't be here if he hadn't created you. That's number one. In addition to keeping you alive on life support, and let's stop and talk about that for just a minute. What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? See, they were given immortality yes, they lost back before that, and they lost it. So what happened? Well, didn't they have to partake of the tree of life in order to be Im yes. immortal? Yes. And, and, and that's, yeah, um, right. No, that's an important point, yes. Yeah. So, uh, um, but they chose to listen to They to lived for way. another 900 years, so how do, that, how do they do that? Yeah. Well, I think how do we live? The human, We're sinners. The, sinners are supposed to die. The human species just gradually deteriorated. Mm-hmm. Eve had to be a big woman, too. You don't see that anywhere in it. Yeah. It's like it's just we've gradually shrunk over the eons of time. Yeah. But why, does it, why, is, it, why is it we're still breathing and our heart is, hearts are still beating? Well, that quote you have here from Ellen White, that yeah. everything keeps, if he stops the sustaining. So, so in our day, in, in, in more advanced societies where they have all this fancy stuff, we talk about CPR. What does CPR mean? Cardiopulmonary. 
cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Someone's beating on your chest and someone else is using either a bag or blowing into your face and so forth. God is literally keeping all of us alive every minute. If he withdrew his life-giving power at any instant, we would all be flat dead. So we are, we are, on, we are on life support. So if that's, you abuse your body meanwhile, you're going to have a short of a version anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of us on life support in our sinful world, it is the power of God which allows us to understand and incorporate his word into our lives. But more than that, it is that power which will be able to create us and anew, create us anew at God's second com coming, and it will give us the, a life that will never end. So we will then get an immortal life. Second Peter 1 4 talks about that. In this way, he has given us the very great and precious gifts he promised, so that by means of these gifts, you may escape from the destructive lust that is in our world and may come to share the divine nature. Hold on, wait, whoop, back up. Share the divine nature? What does that mean? That's a, that's a pretty incredible statement, isn't it? Yeah. Well, here's a possible explanation from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 555. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated. What, what does that mean? Becomes like. Absorbed. Yeah, absorbs. That which it is accustomed to love and reverence. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. So, what is she saying there? In the spiritual life, just as in the physical life, without God, we would, we would cease to exist. There would be, I mean, that's what happened back before the flood and why God had to send the flood, because virtually everybody had turned away from him. And there's nothing more he could do because they were running as fast as they could go in the other direction. So what can we expect to happen in our lives as we incorporate God's word and then share it with others? Jim? 6 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in the truths that you were taught and firmly believe. You know who, you were, who your teachers were and you remember that ever since you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Earlier, he told us who, who his teachers were. Do you remember? His mother and his grandmother, Eunice and Lois, right? Yeah. So this is a young man who was trained by his female ancestors. Okay? Verse 16, all Scripture inspired by God, and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving the instructions for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. Good News Bible. Now I'm I, going to... You pointed out that I left the word is. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm going to do that. It turns out that those words is is in the first part of verse 16 are not there in the original. You have to decide where to put, it says literally in the Greek, all scripture inspired by God, useful for teaching the truth. So where do you want to put, do you say all scripture inspired by God is useful? Or you say all scripture is inspired by God and is useful? Or all scripture is inspired by God, useful? Maybe it'd be worth giving a little bit of a brief explanation as to why that is, because Paul is writing, mm -hmm. And there was a lot of written materials going on about this. Yeah. So he was saying, the scriptures that are that are inspired, me, inspired, that are inspired by God is what's useful. Yeah. Not just because maybe the Gnostic Gospels would be coming down the pike yeah. and so forth. Yep. So there were a lot of things available to Timothy in those days. And Paul says, you have been trained well. That's what he said up there in the verses before. And you know how to distinguish between what is reliable and what's not. You know what's scripture, what's holy scripture, what's inspired, and what is not. So, stick with the inspired stuff, right? Yeah. Okay? Well, we tend to think if something, if it's a book, it must have value. Yeah. 
you know, and especially if it's got a cover on it. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it must it work, be worthwhile. No, there's a lot of, you can save yourself a lot of reading if you get a discernment of what, where the truth lies. Anyway, John 17, 14 to 17. I gave them your message. This, of course, is Jesus' prayer just before he was crucified. I gave your, them your message, and the world hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as I sent, me, just as you has, just as you have sent. Oh, excuse sent me. me, as you just as you sent me into the world. I'm sorry. And for their sake, I dedicate myself to you in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. Now I'm going to ask you all a question, which maybe you haven't thought about. I want you to think about it right now, and have you out there think about this as well. Where was Jesus when he prayed this prayer? Garden of Gethsemane? Gethsemane no? Well, we just automatically assume that. But if you read what follows this, it talks about, and they entered the garden, and he left. See, if you have him saying that, praying this in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's over there, he's separated from the three, and all the rest of the other disciples are clear out at the gate. There's no way they could have heard any of this. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 the way this is written, at least for us, somebody was listening. It sounds like people are listening. So I don't know whether they stopped maybe at the gate and Jesus prayed for them, offered this prayer, and then he went in, or whether they, because it says at the end of chapter 14 that they left the upper room. And they started, Ella White talks about them, him talking to his disciples as they're walking along, including that thing about the grapevine and all that kind of stuff. So, I don't know, it's a little hard to know, but I, it seems to me like Jesus would want this prayer to have been spoken in the presence of all the disciples. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that, this is truly the Lord's prayer. Yeah. This is truly his prayer. If you're starting at Gen or, uh, chapter 17, verse 1, 1 through 4 is yeah. a lot of material there. Yeah, exactly. So where were they when the, he went on and the, the three or four went to sleep? Well, the, the majority of them, Lu, Lu, I mean, um, uh, Judas is already gone. Yeah. So there's now seven plus three, and I mean, see, uh, eight plus three. So eight of them were left at the gate of the garden. Okay. And they probably must have been finding some places to lie down and to sleep out there. Yeah. And then he, he called three to go, Peter, James, and John, to go on with him into the garden further. Right. They were they were knelt down. Then he said, "No, you stay here." And he moved on even further from them. Yeah. And he's praying over there. And he comes back to James and John and and, and, and Peter. And said three times, "You're sleeping." What were the others doing? They were all sleeping. I'm yeah, sure. Sleeping, yes, I think. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I try to put myself in these situations and think about, okay, what's happening, Hughes? So, so what does studying God's word actually do for us? Well, virus. That, yeah. that yeah, that verse says it reproves our sins, it corrects our erroneous thinking, and instructs us in righteousness. That's education. Yep. Redemption All, is education, I think Ellen White yeah, says. Yeah. All of that happens as we behold and consider and study the life and death of Jesus Christ. Imagine what he has done for us. When we consider all those things, we should stand amazed. And I, I mean, I, I read through the book of Desire of Ages fairly often, and every chapter I'm just amazed and amazed and amazed. But he has promised that by beholding him, we can become more like him. Literally, he promises to share his divine character with us. That's a, uh, you know, mm. if we have been blessed by God's word, shouldn't we be excited about sharing it? Someone has taken the time to carefully count the promises in God's Word. There are more than 3,000 of them. Is it possible for us to claim each of those promises for ourselves? Well, every one of those promises should be applicable in one way to us, one or one way or another to us, right? 
Peter tells us that, quote, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. In the context of the great controversy and the remembering how many times Christ literally met Lucifer, Satan on the battlefield, and that's another thing I'd like us to think about and you out there to think about, how many times can you think in your mind there were direct battles between Christ and Satan? Of course, there was the first one in heaven, right? Yeah. I'll just mention some of them. What about fighting over the body of Moses? Yeah. What would be the next one? What about Daniel 9 and 10, where he's warring against the Prince of, Prince of Persia, remember? And then we could come to the, the times of temptation in, uh, when Jesus is tempted, right? Yeah. And we're not done. I mean, I've just mentioned some of them. Many times, and how many times did Satan win? Zero. Zero. <laughs> you would think after a while he'd sort of get the idea, maybe, I, I don't know, but of course he's, his whole dependence is on trying to overcome Jesus and take his place and so forth, so I can understand why he's fighting every chance he gets. But Well, as we said, Christ met, literally met Satan, Lucifer Satan on the battlefield, beginning in heaven and all the way down to the second coming. What has Christ's death provided that is necessary for us to live godly, spiritual life? And of course, that's the whole question of why did Jesus have to die? And basically, if we could uh, just summarize it in a couple sentences, the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. We can choose to live as far as possible like he lived, or we will die the sinner's death separated from God as he died. He died the death of sinners. Many people maybe don't recognize that, but yeah, that's that's what that's what we're told. And he, nobody was touching him. No. Well, I mean, once he's he's hanging there, he, he, nobody. Yeah, and 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 he died in back in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. and he had God had to send an angel to resuscitate Roger. him. Back, yes. Yeah. The first thing that God does for us is to forgive our sins. That's wonderful. Unfortunately, too many people think that is all that is required for salvation. But it is the Holy Spirit's plan to not only deal with our sins, but also to transform our lives. So the reason for forgiving our sins is not just to, so we can be healthier sinners. What does God want? Gary? I'm reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 13 and 19 to 20. I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. And with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. And with all his abundant wealth through Christ Jesus, my God will supply all your needs. So, you think God has enough to take care of our needs? <laughs> do I, do I? We, we can just smile when we think about that. Yeah. Well, there's another issue that really attacks some people's thinking, and I, I'm going to try to dispel that right now. Living in a world as we do with more than 7 billion other people, that's with a B, we might think that God is not aware of what happens to us individually. No, God doesn't care what happens to me. Well, sometimes it might seem like he is not listening to our prayers or helping us in the ways we feel we need. Diana? Every soul is as fully known to Jesus as if he were the only one for whom the Savior died. Wow. The distress of everyone touches his heart. The cry for aid reaches his ear. He came to draw all men unto himself. He bids them, follow me, and his spirit moves upon their hearts to draw them to come to him. Many refuse to be drawn. Jesus knows who they are. He also knows who gladly hear his call and who are ready to come under his pastoral care. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He cares for each one as if there were not another on the face of the earth. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love, 
revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts, it softens, it subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice, and they follow him. The let, me soul and let me interrupt there for a second. Everything you've just read is absolutely diametrically, diametrically opposed by Satan. He's, he's absolutely declared from day one up in heaven, if you let people, people have complete freedom, they will become selfish like me. Nobody would, would be attracted to you, God, and to be like you, choose to be like you, if they're really free. So it's just the people who are, you know, in slavery to you that uh, you, you control them, yeah, well, maybe you get them to do it, but, but that's not true. What did the, what did the verse say? God make his, he, he, he has to make us free in order to give us free, in order to make it possible for us to love him. There's no possibility of love if, if, uh, if there's no freedom. God so. is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, uh, somebody uh, pointed out the other day, something came up and I says, the person says, I don't use uh, God in it many times. And when I'm teaching kids, that's what it was. She was, said she didn't use the term as love doesn't do that. Love doesn't do such and such. Hmm. And it, 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 it kind of struck a chord with me. Yeah. That uh, God isn't, it isn't that God's loving. God is. God is love. Yeah. Does God steal? Does God kill? Does God uh, yeah. do uh, all kinds of, uh, the, the list of bad things. Yeah. We, we call. So anyway, <laughs> I, th I kind of. A, like, Sorry, Diana, we interrupted your reading there. Uh, let me see where I was here. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. For me, that is, is yeah, the amazing. important. That amazing. It only takes one. Yeah. yeah. God, will you, would, if, if, if it came to that, he would prove his case in the great controversy by saving one person. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page 480. Wow. Hebrews eleven six. let me just read that real quickly. No one can please God without faith. For whoever comes to God must have faith that God exists and rewards those who seek him. Without faith. Where would we be without faith? Yeah. Okay. Um, it goes on to, Hebrews 11 goes on to explain that the children of Israel failed to enter the promised land because they lacked faith. That was also true of the followers, fellow citizens of Jesus in the city of Nazareth in his day. You remember Matthew 13, 58? Because they did not have faith, he did not perform many miracles there. I mean, this is his hometown. He loved everybody there. I, I, he, must have, he must have wept as he walked out of that town. He must have wept as he walked out of that town. Here are these people that he's lived with all his life, and they don't want to listen to him. Hmm. So do we understand what faith is and why it is such a key to salvation? Well, Acts 16, 31 says these words. This is Paul. Remember Paul and Silas were in that prison in Philippi and there was that terrible earthquake. And of course, what was the earthquake from? The angel showing up to unlock them, right? And they got out of prison. Well, they, they were free anyway and the jailer was going to come kill himself because he knew that he was responsible for, be, for the lives of everybody in that room or in those multiple rooms, I don't know how, how they were. Anyway, Paul and Silas, and he says, what must I do to be saved? The jailer said this, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, believe, that is the same word as have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. And you know that he, they, he, went, they, he took them back to his house, he cleaned up their wounds, he, they preached to the rest of his family the rest of his night and, and they, were, they became Christians. So, come on now, could it be true that faith is the only requirement for salvation? Is that possible? Well, I see you thinking. Seems to, it keeps coming up. 
Well, that word faith, there's, if you look at the definitions, the first one that pops up is the word persuasion. Mm-hmm. Now, Jesus, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, okay? And that means it, the idea that God communicates through words. Mm-hmm. He's a teacher, mm-hmm. not a penalty payer. So he wants to educate you so that you can be persuaded and make the, the, a good choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, kind of I kind of wrestled work that. And out. if you think about the plan of salvation, we believe there's salvation by faith, there's righteousness by faith, there's justification by faith, there's sanctification by faith. Is there some kind of a pattern there? What is the commonality here? <laughs> What's the commonality there? Okay, well, let's see what we can do with faith. The word uh, uh, salvation and save was uh, uh, health or healing. Yeah. And uh, what is what is the most sick part of our person? It's the way we think. Yeah. It isn't our we have pancreatic cancer or whatever. But no, it's the, that that's the eternal. Okay. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that there's a definition of faith that I love. It was it's based on all of Scripture. Uh, was put together, the actual words were put together by my mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell. And this is what he said. Faith is just a word we use because if you go to another language, it's a different word. So let's not make too much of the five letters there. Uh, It's just a word, it's a symbol that we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. So faith is a word to describe our relationship with God. Well, now, you can see why that should be pretty important, right? Our relationship to God. So, let's think about what that implies. The better we know Him, the better the relationship may be. Now, unfortunately, we can't say will be because remember the story of Lucifer. I mean, who knew knew God or, or supposedly knew God better than Lucifer? And yet, what did he do? He rebelled, right? So, maybe, but not will be, always. Faith implies, let's go on and talk about it, faith implies an attitude toward God of love and trust, which is another word for faith, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed. Now, that's one of the questions. So, our faith is based on what? Evidence. And that evidence is is from the scriptures. To be willing to believe what he says, as soon as we are sure he's the one saying it, to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he's the one offering it. Remember, we say that because Satan is constantly trying to say things, he's trying to offer things as if he were God. He wants to be in the place of God. So we have to be sure about these things. to accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he's the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it, without reservation, for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for salvation. But there's another part to that story that we we need to mention here. Faith also means that, like Abraham, read Genesis 18. Job, read Job 42, 7 and 8. Moses, Exodus 32, 5 to 14, and Numbers 14, 11 to 25. These are people who are described in the Bible as God's friends, okay? These are God's, some of the best friends in the Bible. What, is it, what did they do? They asked him why. Why are you doing this? Abraham asked, why are you destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? Job said, you know, why is all this happening to me? Moses said, you know, why are you asking me to leave these people and have all, you know, why don't you just take me away and get rid of me and, you know, you've given me this job I can't do. Why, God? So we need to have the courage when we're looking at the evidence to say, okay, why? Why is it like that? Now, God doesn't, so what does that really mean? Why do you ask, why does somebody ask why? Assuming they're serious. They want to know more, right? Yeah. So if faith is a word that describes our relationship with God, we would ask why because we want him knowing more. I mean, that's, that's what our, our salvation is based on, right? Knowing God? 
your favorite word verse, Jim. John 17, 3? 17, 3 and 4. Yeah? Yeah. Eternal life is to know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And I have, he has, verse 4, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. Right. And he hasn't even died yet. Mm -hmm. What was he doing? He was teaching. He was revealing God. He never, no place did he explain, you know, I'm going to do this here in, in a few hours and uh, I'm going to pay for all your sins. No. Not there, you can't find that in the Bible. No. So those who truly trust God, have faith, believe in Him, will enter into an experience that they are excited to share. Jim? No sooner does one come to Christ than that there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. If we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. Steps Christ, 78. Christ, yeah. Do you find that to be your experience? Are you so excited about your relationship to God that you speak about it sort of almost whenever you can? Think about that. Well, Paul is an ex excellent example, and I would throw just a little verse, a funny little verse in that we don't quote very often. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Think about that for a moment. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Wow. Yeah, would you dare to? Yeah? He would have to exercise a lot of self-control. Yeah. He couldn't let his hair down, yeah. so to speak. Right. <laughs> So would we dare say that? Think about your situation, the people you associate. Would you dare to say, friends, the God I know is so good that I'd like you to know about him too. Okay, Carrie? Uh, readings from Romans 1, verses 14 to 16. For I have an obligation to all peoples, to the civilized and to the savage, to the educated and to the ignorant. So then, I am eager to preach the good news to you also who live in Rome. I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Now you notice something interesting there uh, in looking at that verse. Do you remember what it says in the King James? Especially verse 16? Let me... Just pick the New Revised Standard here and said it's a little easier to, to see. For I, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Why would he say that? It literally, literally says that, but my Good News Bible turns it around to the positive. I have complete confidence in the gospel. So which do you think is correct? I like the, the, this Good News translation. Yeah. There. It's, it's, a, it's a valid rendering, I would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if we make the Bible our study and seek every day to learn more about God and to approach closer and closer to an understanding of Him or them, then God will show us what we need to say to those who need to hear it. Would we dare to pray to God saying, God, in the morning, show me where you want me to witness today? Or are we afraid to do that? It has not become part of us. <laughs> yeah. There are three key principles in all of this. We need to know what we should say, one. Two, how we should say it. And three, when we should say it. There are appropriate times to say things and appropriate times not to say things, right? When and how. Yeah. What, when and how. Exactly. Our bodies are built up from what we eat and drink. And as in the natural economy... So in the spiritual economy, it is what we meditate upon that will give tone and strength to our spiritual nature. The theme of redemption is one that the angels desire to look into. It will be the science and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Is it not worthy of careful thought and study now? 
The Bible was not written for the scholar alone. On the contrary, it was designed for the common people. Can I interrupt for a second? Think about having, think about joining a class to study the plan of salvation and Jesus is the teacher. Okay. <laughs> you know, I would say, don't let this ever stop. Let's just keep studying. I, I can, I, we will be studying it forever, right? To the ceaseless ages. Well, as we think of the, of the people that, that were looking for, for the truth and they would study verse by verse, mm -hmm. they wouldn't move on. I mean, we're going to be, it's going to take us forever yeah. to get out of Genesis, out of the creation. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and all of that, we, I mean, and we're going to get to see that. We're, I think God is going to basically show us that panorama. We're going to see the progress through the whole scripture, and especially the, the main aspects of the great controversy, but I, I can hardly wait. I think it's going to be just fantastic. The great truths necessary for salvation are made as clear as noonday, and none will mistake and lose their way except those who follow their own judgment instead of the plainly revealed will of God. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 88 and 89. So you can't be saved unless you know about how the justification and the sanctification and the imputed and the imparted and the... Right? Well, some of that stuff is just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo <laughs> that people can't understand and confuses them and turns them off, I think. <laughs> okay. There are many advantages to careful, thoughtful study of the Bible. There is nothing... Is Ellen White again. There is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties, as the broad and nobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. But there is but little benefit derived from a hasty reading of the scriptures. One may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. And that's especially true if you have your favorite version of the Bible and you just keep reading it. Because if you read something too many times, it's very easy to just sort of... So I think that pretty regularly we ought to say, okay, I love my version, but let me set it aside for a bit and let me read those familiar verses in a different translation. What? Yeah, I guess it does say that, doesn't it really? I, I hadn't thought about that in, in light of this other translation. So I, I think we need these other translations. Okay, one may read the whole Bible through and yet fail to see its beauty or comprehend its deep and hidden meaning. One passage, Diana, here you are, one passage studied until its significance is clear to the mind and its relationship, its relation to the plan of salvation is evident, is a more of value than the perusal of many chapters with no definite purpose in view and no positive instruction gained. Wow. Keep your Bible with you as you have opportunity to read it. Fix the text in your memory. Even while you're walking the streets, you may read a passage and meditate upon it, thus fixing it in the memory. Steps to Christ 90 and 91. I was just listening to something this week from Ellen White. She was, she was traveling in a train car. Uh, there was a fair number of Adventists in the car. They were going to some meetings, but there were a lot of people who are not Adventists. So the Adventists started singing and they started preaching and she's, she's carrying a, <laughs> a, a, a service right there in this Train cars, they're, they're, they're traveling along. Think about the Bible, and the, think, I'm sorry, think about the people in the Bible who were brought to the truth by Jesus and by others when they reached out to them. Do you think the Holy Spirit prepared the hearts of those people before he brought them to Jesus or the apostles? Um, if you read Desire of Ages, you will discover that several times it'll say things like, like the woman who... Um, who, who I think was, there's other different places. Even the, the man who was, the paralyzed man who was brought by his friends. It talks about Jesus attracting them while they're still at home. And it talks about Jesus was aware of them while they were still at home. 
and he's preparing. So who does all that? The Holy Spirit's active. The angels are active, right? They're preparing. So there's people out there. You think about this. There is people. There are people out there that God is preparing for you to witness to them. You think you can identify them? Well, could we trust the Holy Spirit to prepare the hearts of people with whom we associate on a daily basis so that when the opportunity, when the opportune moment comes, we will be able to speak a word on God's behalf? Think about it. We need to also be sure as we're reading the Bible, reading the Word, that mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is, is invited in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's useful sometimes to read portions of Scripture and discuss together, as we do here in Sabbath School class, uh, with a few other people. Yeah. And someone will say, well, no, that's not what that says. That's not what that means. That's not what... And I think th that's a very... Or you read a verse that you've read a hundred times and then all of a sudden you see a completely new meaning to it. Yeah. And that's part of the reason why I think once in a while we need to read it in a different version. Yeah. And, you know, there's the, the very traditional, very sort of literal translations like the King James or the New King James or maybe the RSV. And then there's others that are sort of somewhere in between that try to stick as close to the text but make it in more readable English. That's why I use the the new the good news bible very much and then there's others that are that are paraphrases and w once in a while i love to read from the message bible or the uh, the living bible and i recognize that they're not precisely translations you know they add other things in there that are not exactly in the original uh language but it, it asks you it, it gets it forces you to ask yourself oh i want is that what they really had in mind and so forth so I think it's good to have, I think everybody should have at least three or four versions and they should be spread over a range from the paraphrase to the more literal and sometimes we need to put them down. Well, I, I'm spoiled because on my computer I have about 50 versions in multiple languages and I, I can line them all up here side by side. Sometimes I've found that the uh, Bible in basic English yeah. is quite helpful. Yeah. And it has only a vocabulary of a thousand words. Yeah. And it's, but it's, it would, what is it called? Bible in Basic English. Oh. It's very useful for this reason. Oh, no, they have to throw out all that legal and, and, and theological mumbo jumbo, and they have to say exactly what they think the author was trying to say. That's what my Bible does quite a lot. My, my good news that I use all the time is it's not limited to the thousand like the Basic English, but it's, li it's limited to a relatively limited vocabulary because it's intended by the American Bible Society to be a basis for which, from which many people can translate into a lot of different other languages. So you need to, you know, when you're trying to prepare a document for translation, you don't want to get fancy with, you know, funny idioms and, and long theological words and so forth. You Well, occasionally people may come for, to us depressed or anxious, and if we are willing to listen, they will divulge that they have hidden sins or problems with which they do not know how to deal. Such people need the Holy Spirit in their lives. But what, what role should we play? I mean, where are we in this mix? Sometimes we feel that it is the work of the pastor through his preaching, particularly on Sabbath mornings, to attract people to the gospel. Well, that's not exactly that's not what we have been told. Jim? Your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments, but upon your ability to find your way to the heart. By being social and coming close to the people, you make <coughs> this current of their thoughts more readily than by the most able discourse. The presentation of Christ in the family, by the fireside, and in small gatherings in private houses is often more successful in winning souls to Jesus than are sermons delivered in the open air or in the moving throng or even in the halls or churches. Ellen White, Gospel Workers, 193. Wow. So does that mean if you meet with your friends and sit down with them and talk about the truth and convince them to begin believing it, 
that that's more important than what the pastor does? I think it all depends where you live. Yeah. What's sure. the average age in your street? Mm -hmm. Who's working at home and who goes out? Who's got little kids? Uh, and I mean little ones. I've got mm -hmm. two families in my street from about two on, on up. Two families that go to the same church. But uh, I've had rare occasions on airline of somebody will bring something up, you've got a seatmate. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with that, but you never know what happens in the end. I mean, you <laughs> Dr. Maxwell tell, talks about a time when he was on a flight and all of a sudden smoke started pouring out of it, looked like it was coming out of the roof racks. Yeah. And boy, everybody wanted to talk about God. <laughs> that was out over the Atlantic Ocean, I think it was. Boy, everybody, anyway, somewhere out there. And all of a sudden, people wanted, well, whatever. Are you a pastor? You know, what, what, what? Pretty soon the smoke was gone, and everybody went back to their, <laughs> their usual stuff. But, you know, all it takes is a little shake-up, and I, I have to chuckle uh, on the national news, you know. Um, we, we talk about, you know, where we come from evolution, and this evolution is the stuff, and so forth. But suddenly there's a national disaster, and we do what? We all need to pray. We all need yes. to pray about yes. it. Yep. Who are we praying to? The slime or the, the the lizards or the birds or the the dinosaurs? Yeah. yeah I wonder if anybody's thought that through. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Hubble telescope has revealed to us just a small portion of the vastness of God's universe. Try to imagine having a personal relationship with someone who created all that. Yeah. The Bible is not just a book of do's and don'ts or a book of seeds to be done and sins to be shunned. It is a way to access the power of God for transforming lives, including ours. Can you, can you think of ways in which the Bible has enlightened your life or protected you from serious problems? I remember, I remember a time when, and I don't have time to explain all, exactly how this happened, but this was back in the days when there were no seat belts. And, well, there were sweet seat belts, but you, know, you didn't have to wear them. And my children were leaning out the window with their heads completely out the window and a truck come by, came by from the other direction mm -hmm. and my wife called the, my children to come in because it, it was a combi, Volkswagen combi, so we called them in because it was time she was preparing some sandwiches to eat. They pulled their heads in and just a few seconds later a truck came by so close to us that it clipped my rear view mirror. Yes, yes. Gonna... Just imagine if my kids both had their heads still sticking out that window. Wow. Well, how has the truth of God's word affected your natural tendencies to stubbornness, envy, greed, and selfishness? Now, of course, I'm sure that none of you have those kind of symptoms, but kind of problems. But many years ago, Matthew Henry wrote a fairly extensive commentary on the whole Bible and made these comments of, about the Bible as seed. It, the seed in brackets, will come up though it seem lost and buried under the clods it will find or make its way through them. The seed cast into the ground will spring forth, let, but the word of Christ have the place it ought to have in a, conver in a soul, and it will show itself, as the wisdom from above doth in a good conversation. And that's Matthew Henry's commentary on the Bible. And then it says in the brackets, uh, is that? Yeah. Note that the brackets and words and brackets in the first three lines are in the Bible study guide. Yeah. You may have felt like you have tried in the past to plant the seed of truth in someone's mind as you had opportunity. You may have found that they did not seem to respond, but the seed is still there, and only God knows if, how, and when that seed will, splant, will, will sprout. One important principle to understand about sharing the good news about God is that people are much more open to accepting new ideas when they are in a period of transition. So what kinds of things are transitions? Maybe they're facing a health challenge. Think about the COVID-19 thing. People are asking, you know, people are dying. I just talked today to a young lady that went she she got sick and she seemed to have all the symptoms and she went and she started getting really panicky. She got tested, it turns out that she didn't have it was something else that gave her some of the similar symptoms. But, I mean, all of a sudden, oh, you know, and you know how that is. 
Well, other, place, other times of transition, maybe a job crisis or a change in a relationship, those are very good times for us to reach out to them and share the good word. Sabbath school lessons should be training, I mean, I'm sorry, Sabbath school classes should be training grounds for us to learn how to share the good news with others. They are not to be sermons given by the Sabbath school teacher. How many times have you gone to a church, especially if it's a little bit larger church, and it's just like it's a second sermon. Yeah. Someone gets up there and, you know, it's too much, it's, you know, there's too many in the audience and the, the, the person up front is too far away to hear what they have to say, so it's like a second sermon. That's not what the Sabbath school is supposed to be for. Um, they are not just entertainment. They are supposed to be training sessions. In today's world where we want everything right now, mm -hmm. when we talk to someone, we sometimes expect, you know, the, the fireworks to go off and yeah. lights to come on, all that. And we need to be patient. Yep. And we may never know yep. the result. In fact, probably most of the time, we will not know the outcome. Maybe unless we, until we get to the better land. Yeah. Yeah, I know. We, we, and sometimes we think, well, you know, this person looks like they're uneducated. Maybe they're homeless or whatever like this. Well, you know, if I try to speak to them, it's not going to, you know, they're not going to, or maybe they, they, you might think they're under the influence of something or they've been drinking alcohol. And Oh, this person's not going to pay attention. You don't know. God has given us a responsibility to share the good news, and we need to be willing to do that. Um, and you, you might only say a few words, but s somehow it might spark in people's, uh, in, in people's minds. I, um, I work in a, in a clinic, and I have a lot of patients who've come and see me for years. That they, they, they keep coming back for all their health needs. And because of the COVID-19 stuff going on, um, we... We've, we're requiring everybody to call in by, on telephone and, they, and they, just, they get to talk to us by phone. And they keep saying, but it's not the same. We, we want to see you. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of influence that you have on people when you're... So try, the, try this challenge. Ask God every morning to bring someone into your life that would needs to hear about God. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be prepared to respond? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, you have put us here for a reason. You have a plans for our lives. You have a work for us to accomplish. You're willing to work with us. If we just give you an opportunity, Lord, give us the courage and the insight that you can give us when it's time to speak up and when it's time to be a partner of yours is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.